Juan, it's great to have you here. Could hey you uh, Good to be could here. you give us the uh, short bio of uh, of yourself before we start getting into uh, oh boy. Sort of boutique? Uh, I remember start... you're amongst friends, so we we go all informal. I I had a very vivid imagination, but I could not draw to save myself. So I started using computers and I happened to be good at it. So I started with computer graphics and effects and eventually kind of by accident, uh, almost by accident, I got into color grading and I liked it. Uh, That was after having a career in visual effects, visual effects supervision and all that stuff. Um, I loved it and I continued. That was like almost 15 years ago. So, <laughs> and then after that, it's been doing um, little big project, uh, like some bigger projects, bigger projects, bigger projects, and uh, trying to learn along the way and try to keep it interesting. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, I just, uh, I don't, how, how long have you been, been with us? Because we're, we're in hour number seven, my friend. Oh, you haven't yeah, been with us in the beginning, have you? I to be, I've been here in, on, an, on and off for the last like three hours. Uh, like uh, I, I didn't remember that this weekend we actually had like a little bit of a family trip. So now I'm sitting on like a hotel room <laughs> instead of my facility. I wanted to be at the office, but I'm not. Uh, but I've been able to keep up a little bit. Outstanding. Um, I, I just love, so everybody knows. We have, we have like 200, more than 200 people right now. More yeah. than 200 people. Is that crazy? For, for our number six into seven, yeah, it's amazing. Oh, shit, I know that. <laughs> Is this your new real one? Yeah. And just talk a bit about some of it while we're watching it. Uh, I wanted to build it in a way where I could see mostly characters, you know, like different, it's different projects ranging for that. Like I hadn't been able to do a reel in the last eight years. So it was fun to put this one together. This is from the Alienist from this year, as glorious 2020. But there's other footage from uh, other TV series and features that I've been doing in the last, in the last few years. Um, I wanted to put shot, you know, I, I didn't want it to put like the big, just the big, big, colorful shots. I wanted to make some, make it something a little bit more intimate. You know, it might not be, it might not be the typical shots that you put on a reel sometimes. You know, especially if you see one of the big facility reels, have like the big oceans, big shots, big things, and that's all great. But I think a lot of a lot of our work goes around telling stories and uh, and being able to portray characters, portray moments. Totally. Um, and it's all about people, isn't it? It's all about people. That's some great facial reasons. That was the idea, and and uh, that's another reason why. That's the other reason why it was like a more like mellow kind of song, like with the piano and stuff, instead of like the typical like oh, God, I know, things flying around. I like we have seen, we've seen a lot of those, um, and I don't know. I, I wanted to do a reel that felt kind of like the kind of work that we do like we have done an action we have done big science fiction and all that stuff but usually the some of the prayers that are the most proud of are like you know, a little bit more intimate ones so uh, now this, this body of work how many years is this over that we're looking at here we're looking at footage from the last i would say it's footage from the last four years yeah, probably the older one is this one is not, this one is the older one it's called chosen that's the season three that one I probably did five years ago, maybe. That's the end shot of the season, actually. Man, it's beautiful, man. It's good. Well done. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It took, it took me a while. Like I've been like seriously the last seven, eight years. I've been like I have to, I have to do another reel. But like you don't have time. You're working, and it's like when people ask for stuff, you just send them to IMDb and like look at my credits, look at what I've done. And I can send you a few trailers, right? But uh, uh, with uh, with COVID and everything slowing down a little bit, I was like, well, now I have time to do stuff. <laughs> so, and I'm going to say that just give people an idea on where your shop is. You're in Santa Monica, yeah? That's correct. We're in Santa Monica, California. Uh, we have four four and a half color rooms. We have four color rooms and one that is a little bit more multi multifunctional with our machine room and stuff. Uh, our tool of choice is Mystica, which is different that most of the people here probably go towards Resolve or Baselight. 
Uh, I know there's a few Nukodas, like, uh, like Adam, uh, but uh, we do Mystica. I've been using Mystica for the longest time. I'm, I'm really happy with it. And I think, especially for the philosophy that I have at my, at my studio, because we like to do like, uh, we like to get very technical with things. Mystica give me that flexibility. We also have a couple of resolves that especially for some of the outputs that are like more standard, it's just easy. You don't even have to think, you just throw the video render and, and it comes out well. So, so that's a little bit of the idea. Can you see this one? I can, I can, I can screen share myself too. Oh, you have it. Well, you have it there, so you can. Yeah, I, that's. Fine. I don't even have time to write a tweet. Where do you get time to make this beautiful thing? <laughs> like when I was trying to figure out what I was going to talk about, I, I I was like I was like there are so many things that I want to talk about, and I don't know what people will be more interested in 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 listening to. So I started kind of I, I've always used this Kogol thing for mind mapping on projects and conferences and stuff like that. So I started with just a few branches and kind of like a plant. It started growing into into multiple things. And uh yeah, like I don't know. It's just things that I believe people are gonna be curious about. I think there's a lot of when you're talking about doing a boutique or stuff, I think there's like a lot of uh, misconceptions from the people doing it and from the producers and stuff. And uh, and there, I, I wanted to kind of portray the things that are the most important. You know, like uh, like I, I do, I did a couple of bullet points here. If you let me open it for myself, like kind of to say what is not what a, what is a boutique and what is not you know what i mean like i've had i've had three studios lightbender is my third studio the other two were in spain and uh and i've had all kinds of combinations like i've had partners i've had another company as a partner and this lightbender is just uh my own um with of course my employees and everybody that work with me um but the, that format does not matter i mean different people go to that place for through different paths but there are a few things that are important and is that like especially since resolve became free or like 300 dollars, which is basically free uh, there has been a lot of people like it's just working from like a home office and stuff like that and and i want to clarify like it's great that people is doing that um, but that's a freelancer with their own equipment and it's awesome and i hope they're super successful but that's not a boutique you know i think the reason why sometimes producers are not entirely comfortable going to a boutique is because everything that is not a facility, it feels like there's going to be something that they're not getting in, in return. And it, and it is not like that. It's more like the opposite. So we have to make sure that if you're going to start putting together a boutique, it cannot be just from the from an office in, in your home. You know, you, ha you have to start putting it together, even if it's a small office. Like my first office was super tiny, but it was an office, you know, because you're going to need other things. You're going to need security. You're going to need infrastructures, multiple systems. I mean, you're not going to need 300 systems, but you're going to need a few. Like uh, at, at Lightbender, we had around seven, eight systems uh, with different functions, different capabilities. You need a machine room for that. Um, so a machine is not, a, a boutique is not a person working on their home office. A boutique is not an excuse to do things wrong or not able to provide service. You know, a boutique is not an excuse. It's not like, oh no, because we're a boutique, we cannot do that. Not really, especially nowadays with the amount of tools that you have in the market for really affordable prices, some of them free, some of them, there's there's so many things like from doing DCPs, okay. deliverables, all kinds of things. Okay, uh, mate, let's, let me, let's say you've decided on Mystica and you said that's your tool of choice. Mm -hmm. Most important thing in the room is you. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have any other use in Lightbender or is it just you or do you have A or B colorists working with you? I do. I have colorists working with me. In fact, I like that dynamic a lot. Usually in my office, I'm like the supervising colorist. Uh, and then I have people like Fran Lorite, who's working with me. At one point, I had uh, Alvaro Barraza, uh, which is another Spaniard who used Mystica working with me. And working on a TV series, for example, for me, it was very easy to be focusing on one episode or on setting up looks for certain episodes. And then once I had the looks, kind of give it to them so they could work on it. And I think the work is, is more than just an assistant colorist because they are making creative decisions. And, uh, and at the same time, you also need some infrastructure people. I had, uh, for the last break that we we did, uh, which is the alienist uh, for TNT, um, it was a team of five people, you know, so, and then if the project is small, it can be, it, it, it can be just a, 
as small as one or two. And I think it's very important to be able to keep that flexibility. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this into the chat, folks. What is the second most important thing in the room? Just put it in the chat panel. We'll see what what one says. Mm -hmm. What's the second most important thing in the room if the colorist is the first? People is working. No, once one guy said the client, which is true. I mean, you cannot. I mean, you need a client. <laughs> the love, somebody said. The booze, the booze cabinet. Yeah, we don't see that as much now, unfortunately. I yeah. think most people are going to say the monitor. What are you using for your monitor? One. Uh, my my main monitor right now is a Sony a VVM X three hundred, uh, and and I love it. I love it. I have that one. I have also a Flanders and a couple of others. Uh, but I do believe that the most important thing is a monitor. Uh, when uh, when I do like on my chart, if you look at the area of investment priorities, which is the green branch on the left, I put like number one is monitoring and storage, calibration, systems and security. And some people might get surprised that I put systems on number four. But the truth is that uh, if you have nowadays, most systems can do real time. Most systems are fast enough. Uh, but not all monitors are good. Like, uh, like, and I understand when people are starting, they have to use, they cannot use a $30,000 monitor. I mean, I started working with a, one of the old dream color monitors that had like a massive shift to, 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 to magenta, you know, at one point and, and you learn to do it. But, but as, as, as the moment you get uh, a little bit, the, the moment you, you start to be able to, to do something serious, you have to have a good monitor because you have to have something that you can rely on. Otherwise, you're going to be second guessing yourself all the time. Second thing is going to be storage because clients are going to come, footage is going to come, they're going to come with raw, they're going to come with other stuff. You want big storage and you want you want quick st quick storage. And for that, I also have a couple of suggestions down there. Like um, in my case, I went with SGO, which are the makers of Mystica, but their system that they have, which is SGO open storage, actually can work with any kind of system. You know, like, uh, and the one thing that I like about it is what I was talking about before is that it doesn't force you into a specific thing. It's not hardware dependent. So you ca it can grow with you. You can add hard drives, you can do all kinds of things. So you should look into those kind of options. Sometimes it's not good just to have a bunch of Lassie hard drives on the background. I mean, you have to have something that is solid, reliable, that it's uh, sturdy, that there's a backup. If there's no backup, at least is safe enough like for example our our systems are raid six with four different blades so it's like three hard drives on any blade have to fail before we start losing information then calibration is also super important because that's what's going to allow you to be able to work in lesser quality monitors uh, accurately it's going to allow you to even calibrate uh, the client's monitors uh, and it's going to be able to allow you to try to check yourself and to make sure that your room is absolutely up to spec if you have all of that fantastic then move into bigger systems faster systems security so you can go into uh into um larger uh projects with people like uh you know with people like apple disney netflix amazon everybody uh but you cannot even you cannot really do even the simple projects if you don't have good monitoring so explain the security a bit more, because I think this is a bit that uh, more of your people moving into this world would not understand what sort of things you have to do to become compliant for the working with these bigger studios. Well, you have quite a bit of things on, on the document. I put the uh, I put a link to the MPAA's best practices on the orange branch on the bottom. You can see that, um, which people should look at it. I mean, don't be too scared about it because not every studio apply all of it, but it's a good guideline for the things that you should start putting into place. Um, when I moved into my new location in Santa Monica, the first thing that I did was, because I knew that I was going to have to do a huge remodeling. So the first thing that I did was I called the, the, one of the heads of Netflix security and I was like, hey, come over here, walk the space with me and tell me how you want it. And I'll just build it to spec, you know, because that, that seemed more simple. And he came, he was super nice. And, um, and he told me, okay, we want cameras here and here. We have to have doors that are access control, which is the ones that you have like a little swap or a little card. And it knows that every you can select what people are coming in and out. Um, we have to fence 
the machine room, you know, so because so people cannot get through the roof or like something like that. So things that you don't usually think about, you have to think that you're the custodian of really important information. You know, the footage of your client, I mean, it might not look like much when you're doing like a short film for a friend, but when you start doing a TV series, it doesn't have to be Star Wars, you know, it, it, it can be something smaller, but it's still some very valuable IP that if there's any leak or something goes in the wrong way before time, it's going to be a huge problem for the studio and at the end of the day for you, you know. Um, so you have to make sure that you take those things seriously, you know, and that, again, um, there's so many different things, but like, the, mer the bare minimum things that I put on the document are users and passwords on the machines. You can, I mean, sometimes, if, especially if you're working with other people, make sure that it's secure and not everything is like admin. Um, encrypted hard drives, if you're gonna be moving uh, hard drives from one place or another, it's, it, it happens that sometimes a hard drive gets lost. So if those hard drives are encrypted with a password, uh, you will sleep better at night. Um, make sure you have a backup policy, you know, make sure that if, make Put yourself in this scenario. If there was a fire tomorrow and your office will burn down to the ground, how long will it take you to be up and working again? And what would you have to tell your clients? You know, in our case, for example, uh, we, have, we have daily backups of all the projects that we're working on. And uh, those projects, those backups are uploaded to the cloud. So if Hopefully, never. I will never have to find out for real. But if, if at one point everything got destroyed, there was a big earthquake, everything went to hell. If I have a new, if I get an, I rent a new system, I put a new license of it, of Mystica. I have the storage. Well, let me let me move you to the bottom right. Is that lilac down there? Your remote. What have you been doing for remote? I suppose, especially in COVID. But were you moving more of it beforehand? How do you handle that at Lightbender? We have been doing a couple of tests with remote options uh, before COVID, uh, because one of uh, like on, on 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 some of our projects, the DP uh, was not able to be on the session because they were abroad. Uh, so we started doing tests with that and uh, a couple of different systems. Uh, we used Streambox mostly. Uh, we also used um, the one option that Mystica had. It's funny, Mystica had an option for outputting an MPEG4 video that it was pretty stable color-wise um, for VR headset. And I found a way of actually typing that to the outside via a secure internet channel. So we were, before Streambox, we were using that as well. Um, and, uh, and when COVID hit, well, that and of course a combination of sometimes just sending them renders and uh, have them giving notes or using Frame.io or any of the other tools available. Uh, when COVID hit, uh we were in the middle of aliens we were deep 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 into it and um and we had we didn't have to adapt so much with the dp because he was already living in ireland uh, with another project so we were remoting anyway but with the producers locally i mean that was definitely a, a change of years you know like uh, we had to start doing more relaying more into uh, doing uh renders for them so they could review in control environments delivering monitors to their houses and eventually we just signed up for Streambox and we were doing sessions through their um, Streambox remote cloud and all that stuff. Have you seen Have you seen Soho Net's solution? They're coming on here talking about it, their solution later on. I've been following them. I think their solution looks really interesting. Um, the reason why we ended up going with the Streambox on this particular project was mostly because it was, uh, already there, the producers had an account with them and it was available uh, and it was cheaper than other options. The, I mean, I have to research more into Sohonet because I think for me, you, can, you have to have a solution that is not only just remote viewing through the cloud. The remote viewing through the cloud is great, but it has a lot of limitations when it comes down to monitoring. You know, because if people is looking at it on, on an iPad or on their computer and stuff, controlling those monitors to be color accurate is not simple. And if they're just sharing the screen or connecting a video monitor as a secondary screen, 
again, the operating system is in the middle and sometimes it gives problems. I think, I don't know if I remember correctly, but I think either they or somebody else mentioned that they had some some of their own software that was compensating for the for the for the operating system color. Um, so I'll, I'll have to, to look it up. But uh, for now, we are doing mostly in Streambox. Good. Well, hopefully we'll know more later. Let's move up to top right, the red area. Now, your friends around the corner, the likes of Company 3 and the photo cams and the e-films and things, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you pitch yourself against them? They've obviously got uh, more backing behind them and more money behind them, you would think, and a lot of big name colorists. But if you think, obviously, you build your reputation, then you hope the producers come. What's your sort of plan for, you know, a, a PR, I suppose? Well, I feel like it's not so much as position, positioning yourself against them, but as an alternative to them. You know what I mean? I think there are structures that require those big facilities, you know, like uh, sometimes, I mean, especially somebody like Deluxe or Company 3, they have way more things than just color grading. I mean, they're doing distribution, they're doing audio, they're doing all that stuff. And sometimes with the producer, it goes as a package project and there's not much you can do there, sadly. Uh, but I think there is a lot of work that you can do uh, for educating the producers. Uh, you have to think that because a DP, might want, a DP or a director might want to come to your room, but if the producers don't allow them, it may be a big battle. And you have to think that the producers are creatures of risk management. I mean, they are afraid of change. They are afraid of things that were not that were not planned ahead of time and you just have to ease your fears those fears you know like uh, they they fear a smaller place because they feel like they're not going to have that many options or they're not going to have that fast reaction time or they're just not going to be solid and i think those are the things that you have to tackle you know you have to show you no 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 i mean the the way i the way i usually start a conversation is saying like we are we have a boutique approach with the backbone of a facility and I tell them from the technical side, I mean, we have HDR monitoring, we have uh, hardware firewalls, we have MPAA compliance security, we have half a petabyte of storage, everything connected via fiber. You start throwing things at them and say like, hey, this is not a small operation. It's not like we know what we're doing. I mean, this is our credits. This is our footage. This is the stuff that we have graded. This is our technical expertise. And when you're able to bring them into your corner in that regard and being able to to kind of like ease those fears and show them that you're solid, I think that helps, you know? Uh, I don't think the answer is just to slam your prices down because I think uh, if you just charge like a penny for what costs a dollar, you're damaging the industry as a whole and you're damaging yourself in the long run. Uh, I think you have to create a comfortable environment that lures them in, an environment where if they go to a big facility and they have some DA producer constantly looking at a, at a clock and, 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 and telling them to, to, to rush or pay versus maybe coming to your environment and being a little bit more relaxed. And if they go 30 minutes over the time, it's fine. And, and you have, you, you know, you have a different dynamic. I think that will appeal to some of them. And again, not all of them, you know, some systems just need the facility approach, but not all of them do. When you are dealing with budgets, for example, um, I recommend very strongly to be to try to be very budget conscious, uh, to try to stay within it as soon as, as much as you can. And the moment you see that you're steering away from it, to have a conversation. Don't wait until the last minute to like just say like, "Hey, I'm sorry," like you know, like uh, um, this became more expensive. I don't know why. You know, have to you 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 have to really. Mm, Keep them posted and show them that it's, you're not just making costs up. You're not just trying to charge them more, you know, that you're in their corner, you know. Um, as, an, as an every business, keep everything in writing. It's great. I want to say really well done and just goes to show that you can do it. People can do it because they're asking me, can I do it? Should I do it? You've done it. Moved from another country, gone yeah. to a new country, started a post place doing HBA nominated shows. So yeah. man, hats off to you, buddy. Uh, and Thank thanks you. for thanks for coming and sharing.